You are tuned in to The Tea Side, a podcast where we talk total health, life lessons, and music. I'm your host, licensed therapist, doula, and music enthusiast, Tanya D. Now let's get into it. Hello, welcome to The Tea Side Podcast. I appreciate you stopping by. I'm your host, Tanya D. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you do, feel free to share it with someone so they can enjoy it as well. You can also follow me on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And as we close out the month of October and get ready for Halloween, we're going to talk a little bit about it today. And although I don't really celebrate it myself, I do like to see other people participate in it. As I started thinking about it, I think Halloween in the 80s was the absolute best. But before we get into all of that, we have some business to take care of. Now, I'm sure you know October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Ladies, you should definitely be doing your monthly self-exams and going for your annual mammogram every year. Early detection is the best. But today, I'm actually going to give you some information on male breast cancer. Since earlier this year, I lost a friend to this disease. And all I really knew was that men can get breast cancer too, but at a substantially lower rate, like 1%. So I decided to look up some information about it. Much like breast cancer in women, in men, it starts in the breast tissue. So according to the American Cancer Society, until puberty, boys and girls have a small amount of breast tissue consisting of a few ducts located under the nipple and around the nipple area, the areola. But at puberty, a girl's ovaries start making female hormones, causing the breast ducts to grow and what they call lobules form at the end of the ducts. After puberty, boys and men normally have low levels of female hormones, but the breast tissue doesn't really grow that much anymore. Breast cancer can actually start in different parts of the breast, but most of them begin in the ducts that carry the milk to the nipple, and they call that ductal cancer. Some start in the glands that actually make the breast milk, which they call lobular cancers. So men have these ducts and glands too, but usually they aren't functional, like I said. But there are some less common types of breast cancer that start in other types of breast cells, but I won't go into all of those. Now, what I did find interesting was that the average age of diagnosing breast cancer in men is about 72 years old. So basically, age plays a factor. Another risk factor is genetic. So about one in five men with breast cancer have a close relative, male or female, with the disease also. And another factor is obesity. Fat cells in the body convert male hormones into female hormones, which is estrogen. This means that obese men have higher levels of estrogen in their body, so higher risk for them to get cancer. And there are some others, but I'll just have to post a link to the American Cancer Society in the description of this episode if you want to check it out. There's a lot of really good information. And I would be remiss if I did not mention October is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So if you feel like you need some assistance getting to a safe place, if you are a victim of domestic violence, you can always contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE, which is 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to their website, thehotline.org. They have a text as well as a chat feature, and it's confidential, free, 24-7. So if you feel like you need some help, reach out to them, and they can help you find a safe place in your area. And that information will also be linked in the show notes. Now, moving on to Halloween. Like I said, I never really celebrated it much myself, especially as I got older and found out that it was originally associated with the occult. Mm -mm, I don't mess around with that. So you won't really see me posting a lot of stuff about Halloween on any of my pages just because I don't really celebrate it one way or the other. 
Now, that doesn't mean that I don't like watching other people enjoy Halloween. I think Halloween in the 80s, though, like I said earlier, was actually so much fun. It was the best. Although it came out back in the 60s, 1966, I believe, watching It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, was a staple and was always fun. And remember when we could take snacks to school? We had Halloween parties. Somebody's parents would bring cupcakes and, you know, we'd all share candy and dress up in costumes. You know, that was back before everybody was allergic to everything. You can't even bring a peanut to school now. Everybody's got a peanut allergy. And like I said, I never really liked dressing up. I, if I recall correctly, the only costume I had was Wonder Woman. I might have worn it two years in a row. I don't know. But what I do remember is wearing that flimsy plastic outfit that was hot and that doggone hard plastic mask that barely had holes in it for me to breathe. I mean, really, those tiny holes for the nostrils and the mouth and the eyes. And it was just horrible. Of all the dangerous things Gen X kids had to deal with growing up, I think suffocation in that mask might be at the top of my list. I hated those things. But, you know, the good old days. The only other time I recall dressing up was back when I worked for the state and my team dressed up like the cast from ER. I was Nurse Abby and wore purple scrubs that I already had at home. So that worked great. I didn't even have to get dressed to go to work for real that day. Now, let me tell you what I did not like, trick-or-treating, because I don't like having to ask for stuff. I don't like selling stuff, none of that. So I just didn't feel like I should have to do a trick in order for you to give me candy. I figured either you were going to give it to me or you weren't. Truth be told, I figured I might as well just stay at home and eat the candy out of the bowl that we used to give out to the neighbors when they came by. That made so much more sense to me. But, you know, I have to shake my head at myself. Lord, I was a different kind of child. I actually like giving out the candy to the kids that came by. I like seeing the costumes. You know, now I did always give a side eye to the 15-year-old kids, usually a boy in the neighborhood who came by wearing some stupid mask with a pillowcase for his trick-or-treat bag. Boy, if you don't get your old tail out of here... But for real, I don't know. What is the age limit for trick-or-treating? If you taking your little brother or sister, okay, that's fine. Just get some of theirs. If somebody's nice, they might give you a couple pieces too. But nah, stop it. But what was your favorite candy during Halloween? Let me know. I usually like the chocolate candy with the nuts in it. Whether it was a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, Snickers, Mr. Good Bar, Baby Ruth. But I did also like the Twizzlers. And that stale bubble gum that was stale when you got it and you chewed it for two minutes and then the flavor was gone. That was always good just because. Because when you're a kid and you're not supposed to have gum and you get some of that, it was like a cool thing. I never liked bitter honey, though. I dated a guy once who loved bitter honey. I should have known better. That wasn't going to work out. Who eats bitter honey? Maybe you do, but to each his own because they still make it. So somebody's eating it, right? The 80s also produced some of the best and most iconic movies and characters and songs associated with Halloween. Even to this day, movies like Pet Cemetery, Child's Play and Chucky, Poltergeist and Looking to the Light Carol Land, Fright Night, Beetlejuice, and one of me and my brother's favorite, Creep Show. And then we can't forget the trifecta of Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Freddy Krueger. And there's a lot more movies, but those are the ones that just immediately came to my mind. And speaking of the trifecta, they had some of the most iconic sound effects connected to them as well. You just hear the sound and you know what movie it is or what character it's associated with. Which brings me to some of the songs and some interesting facts that I found out about them. And although it's not necessarily as well known as other iconic Halloween songs, but still cool nonetheless, and goes back to my 80s hip hop roots, was Nightmare on My Street by Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, which was on their second 
album, the triple platinum, He's the DJ, I'm the Rapper. It reached number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts and number 9 on the Billboard Hot Black Singles. The song was released as a single on August 1st, 1988. And it was considered for the soundtrack of the movie Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, which was actually released in theaters August 19th. But the producers changed their mind for whatever reason. And if you listen to the song, it sounds like some of the things that they're rapping about is taken directly from scenes from previous Nightmare movies. I think I always thought it was made for the movie because it came out around the same time. New Line Cinema and the Nightmare franchise sued their record label for copyright infringement because they used a sample of the iconic theme music from the film in the song and forced them to actually destroy the video. Thanks to the internet, the video is online and on their official Vivo page on YouTube. They settled out of court, but the vinyl copies of the album have an added sticker that says this song isn't a part of the soundtrack and it isn't authorized, licensed, or affiliated with the Nightmare Films. The full disclaimer is also posted at the beginning of the video. I'll try to link the video on my website. It'll be my first time doing that, so if I get it, post it I'll add that into the description so you'll know it's on there then there's Ghostbusters by Mr. Ray Parker Jr. Now, how that song came about was actually pretty cool I first heard him talk about this during an interview on the Jimmy Jam show last year but I ran across another interview he did several years ago where he talked about being in LA for the first time in a long time to meet with the MCA record executive Gerald Busby because one of his groups, New Edition, wanted to record an earlier song that Ray Parker Jr. had done, Mr. Telephone Man. So quick side note, if you didn't know, Mr. Telephone Man is actually a remake. The original was recorded by a Jamaican teen heartthrob at the time. He was up and coming. His name was Junior Tucker who was also signed to MCA. Ray Parker Jr. actually helped him record his whole album, but because Thriller was blowing up at the time, his whole project got shelved, which sucks. I didn't look. I'm going to have to find out what Junior Tucker is up to these days, but that was kind of messed up. You can actually find the song on YouTube. It doesn't sound bad. It's a slower version than the one that New Edition did. Anyway, Ray Parker Jr. actually got called about a week before the movie wrapped up and was told that they needed him to do a song because they already had about 60 songs people had submitted and none of them were any good. They couldn't use it. And they said the only requirements was he had to use, I don't know, some type of riff from a bar band, pretty much something that you hear bands playing when you go to the bar. And it had to include the word Ghostbusters. I mean, nothing really rhymes with Ghostbusters. So that was almost an impossible challenge, especially in a week. But he said he was up one night in the middle of the night and it was an infomercial about exterminators. And they had these, you know, their spray tanks or whatever it was on their backs. And he remembered seeing a clip from the movie where the guys actually did a commercial advertising their Ghostbusting service. And so with that, he came up with the call and response of who you going to call? He said, because that way he didn't have to put the actual word Ghostbusters in the song. Because basically, if he says who you going to call, he asked the question, somebody else or the person listening to the song could answer. Which was actually pretty genius, because if you listen to the song, he never actually says the word Ghostbusters in the song. It's all a call and response. And the girls that are actually saying Ghostbusters was, I think, his girlfriend and some of her friends at the time. And the courier was supposed to come and pick up the song at nine o'clock. And he said between eight and nine o'clock, when the courier got there, he actually wrote the first verse off the top of his head. He said he just picked up the instruments and started saying stuff. And... He said he didn't have to have the whole song, but the first verse. So basically, that's what he turned in. And the rest is iconic 80s history. How about that? 
And then there's the obvious one, which is Thriller. This is definitely the quintessential Halloween song. This song changed history in more ways than one. It all of a sudden became iconic for Halloween, changed the history of videos, all of that. I remember that video was hyped up so much and it definitely didn't disappoint. I remember literally standing in front of the TV the entire time that it was on, just mesmerized because it wasn't just a video. It was a mini movie, which was directed by John Landis. It was actually 13 minutes long. And what's crazy, I don't remember this, but the song was actually released December 2nd, 1983. I don't know. It wasn't even, again, it wasn't even associated with Halloween. It just became associated with it. But what's crazy, and I didn't even realize this, it never actually reached number one on the charts. It only reached number four on the Billboard Hot 100 and number three on the Hot R&B slash Hip Hop songs. Now, after he died in 2009, it resurfaced on the charts again, but it still only reached number two on the Hot Digital songs. That's crazy. The making of Thriller is 45 minutes long. It was released later, but man, they play it every year. It was groundbreaking. Just watching the prosthetics that they used and how it was high tech for the time, but it was crazy. And so again, although these songs may not have originally been associated with Halloween, they have definitely become synonymous with it. So that's all I have for today. Halloween just doesn't seem like it's the same as it used to be. They have trunk or treat now where people take their kids and they go around parking lots and they get candy from different cars. It's just not the same. But I guess if that's all you know, I guess it works. COVID definitely isn't helping anything. (laughs) Maybe those hard plastic masks will come in handy. I don't know. Oh, I hated those things. But anyway, what are some of your favorite Halloween memories growing up? Do you still dress up? Let me know. I want to see. I actually love to see babies and animals dressed up too. Tag me in your Halloween photos using hashtag the Teesside podcast. And I'll be sure to comment on your costume. And until next time, be kind to yourself and to each other. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Teesside Podcast. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at the Teesside Podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss any of the episodes. And be sure to tell a friend about the show. Until next time.